I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I will make it short. Uh, it's, um, it is, uh, uh, what I'm going to present is a part of a wider research about the Iranian oil nationalization and the role of the World Bank in it, which is uh, in a book that I hopefully will uh, be finishing uh, and it will be published in 2000, in, in 12, uh, sorry, 2021. Um, this is a chapter on the 1933 oil uh, agreement. I have pre-recorded this um, this uh, presentation this morning because I was afraid that perhaps some of the visuals or the audio uh, or audio would not come through. It's an experience I had recently with another presentation. So uh, I will play that uh, pre-recorded presentation, but I'm available for, um, of course, questions and answers afterwards. Good morning and welcome. I am Nader Shamlu and extremely delighted to be with you this morning. I want to thank uh, Professor Milani and the Hamid and Christina Mogaddam program in uh, Iranian studies for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my findings regarding the 1933 Iranian oil agreement and some of the myths and realities that I came across. I look very much forward to our conversation and I very much also look forward to your feedback. Thank you. So why this topic and what is its relevance for us today? Uh, the oil nationalization of 1951 was a critical turning point in Iran's 20th century history, and it has had vast implications not only for Iran, but also for the rest of the world. It mobilized millions of Iranians around a common goal, that of uh, oil nationalization. Its impact and its outcome is still being debated and it's still being researched. Uh, Nonetheless, the consequences of this nationalization still divide the Iranian society, be they inside or outside Iran. A contributing factor to the narrative behind the movement was the 1933 oil agreement between Iran and the AIOC, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. And it was projected, and this agreement was projected as having been contrary to Iran's national interests. What I would like to talk about today is that this agreement is still not being well understood. And I hope that through this webinar, I can explain why. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to propose a simple framework for our consideration in evaluating the different uh, uh, agreements Iran entered into for the development of its oil industry. It's a simple framework that has been widely used and widely accepted. Uh, and uh, a framework that we actually use in our everyday life as well in, uh, in evaluating whether we should enter into a transaction or not. Uh, it is essentially the risk and reward trade-off uh, um, framework. Uh, and on the other side, it is also the uh, factors that improve or uh, weaken one's bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis the counterpart. Uh, of course, with low risk, we cannot expect very high returns, and with high risks, we expect to have high returns. And in terms of the bargaining position, the threat of new entrants can weaken uh, one's bargaining position, access to dire uh, direct access to buyers or end users, it strengthens the in bargaining position, threat of substitutes, of course, uh, weakens one's uh, uh, bargaining position. So this is essentially the framework that I will apply uh, going through this presentation. Most accounts of Iranian oil begin with the Darcy uh, concession that Mozaffar ad din Shah Qajar uh, granted a 60-year concession to uh, William Knox Dar Darcy, an Englishman in 1901, and that kind of transformed the oil industry, not only in Iran, but also in the Middle East and around the world. But the history of Iranian oil goes back much further, and here are some highlights. And because of the geological um, nature of, uh, of the region, oil seepages were observed throughout uh, history and oil was used in everyday applications uh, from setting jewelry to laying bricks to uh, using them in, to insulate boats uh, and so on. 
Uh, in fact, natural gas was one of the important elements in Zoroastrian temples, and it fueled the eternal uh, flame of the of, um, of these temples. But uh, no industry was developed around this natural resource. And they The oil industry didn't even get off the ground, despite the fact that in next door Russia, one could find the world's largest oil producing region. Um, the Nobel brothers had set up uh, several ventures in Baku, which was part of the Iranian empire until about early 1800s. And uh, they had uh, even launched the world's first uh, oil tanker, the Zoroaster. And Russia was the largest producer, about 50% of the world's output came from this region. One of the facets of the Qajar dynasty was that for the first time, Iranian monarchs uh, started to travel to Europe. And uh, here, Nasreddin Shah, who ruled Iran for, uh, for about 50 years in the second half of the 19th century, made several trips to Europe. And he observed and he could see the advances that European countries were making in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. Um, Coming back, he realized that Iran was very underdeveloped and he was keen to give uh, um, concessions to concession hunters at the time to develop Iran's natural resources. One of these uh, concession hunters or one of these investors was Baron Julius de Reuter. And in 1972, uh, Nasir Din gave him, gave him a 70 year monopoly to essentially covering all of the country to develop everything in from infrastructure to banking to oil and minerals, except for gold and natural and uh, uh, precious stones, transport and everything. Uh, this uh, concession ran into considerable uh, problems. The Russian contingent, which was very powerful in Iran, as well as the clergy, objected to it. And Tasir Din Shah was forced to cancel this, um, uh, this concession. Uh, Baron de Reuter had already paid 40 uh, thousand pounds, uh, which had been spent, so he did not get his money back. And later on, he would come back and be given a different uh, concession, which I will talk about later. There were many concessions given uh, specifically for the purposes of, de uh, of developing Iran's oil potential, and they all fizzled out. For instance, there was an 1873 concession to a Dutch firm for uh, exploration around the town of Boucher, unsuccessful, abandoned. An 1884 uh, concession to an American, again, forfeited after a year. Um, in 1889, Reuter uh, returned and was given a 60-year right for uh, to develop or to establish the Imperial Bank of Persia and the Persian Bank for Mining Rights Corporation. Uh, and within that context, he had the right to prospect for oil and minerals. Uh, he was, uh, Iran was supposed to receive 16%. The 16% will come back to, uh, in, in the Darcy um, concession, we will see it. Uh, Reuters spent about 200,000 uh, pounds and got into some trouble or at least um, disagreements with Iranian officials and he abandoned it. He abandoned the, the prospecting. In 1896, Iran gave a concession to uh, a Georgian-born Iranian, Khoshtaria, for developing uh, the oil potential in the north. Uh, in 1900, uh, another um, governor, a local uh, Iranian, received a, a concession to develop the oil fields in Gilan, and three other concessions were given in in 1900, all abandoned, all expired, abandoned, forfeited, and so on. So the glamour of the Persian um, concession was waning, and Iran was kind of, quote unquote, becoming the graveyard of concessions. Even uh, Kalust Kolbenkian, who was a very key figure in the oil uh, uh, development of Russia and in uh, Turkey, um, was offered a concession and he declined it. So how did the Darcy concession happen and who made it happen? Uh, to begin with, uh, there were two uh, academic articles about the geological potential of Iran having huge oil reserves. Uh, the first one was published in 1855 uh, and the second one was published in 1896. 
by Henri de Morcan, a, a French archaeologist, geologist who was doing some work in Western Iran. Uh, this article was brought uh, to the attention of uh, General Antoine Kitabji, an Iranian uh, Armenian uh, customs director. His picture is on the bottom uh, left side. Uh, Henri de Morgan is the one behind the desk, uh, and uh, Antoine Kitabji is the one with the hat uh, and the sign in front of it. Uh, he was the head of the Iran's delegation to the 1900 Paris World Fair. Uh, he sees this article and he's trying to find uh, investors uh, to attract uh, to attract them to come to Iran. He um, approaches um, uh, uh, Sir Drummond Wolf, who had been the ex-UK minister to Iran. His uh, picture is just above uh, Henri de Morgan's picture, uh, the gentleman who was reclining back. And uh, he puts him in touch with, uh, with an um, assistant to Darcy. Darcy had been a, a speculator, a, an investor who had made huge amounts of money in Australia, uh, in, in gold mines in Australia, and was now living in, in the UK. Um, and uh, Darcy looks at the at the proposal and sends his uh, essentially his lawyer uh, Alfred Marriott, who is on the top, uh, to Iran, and they start to work on this concession together with um, uh, Amino Sultan. It's the gentleman with the beard on on, on the top left side, who was the Grand Vizier of uh, Muzaffar Shah in 1900. So the Darcy concession summarized, it consisted of um, Darcy receiving a 60 year concession uh, privilege to, um, to develop the oil industry in all its uh, facets um, in an area of about um, 500,000 square miles, essentially all of Iran except the five northern provinces that were reserved for, uh, for Russia. He had the right to lay a pipeline um, a right to buy state land, which he did, and uh, or private lands, or the, be given the right of way. Um, he was assured of Iranian safety and security, and the concession was to expire within two years if nothing happened. Iran was to receive 20,000 in um, cash and 20,000 pounds paid in uh, shares into the first company. It was uh, it was to receive um, 2,000 two months per year for oil um, uh, revenues that it received otherwise from local uh, production. It was to receive 16% uh, of net profits of any company that was formed under the concession. Um, it had, uh, it could assign a, an imperial commissioner uh, to, to look at the books, to have access to the books. It had to use, uh, it. it uh, the concession had to use Iranian workers other than uh, technical staff. Uh, it had to um, supply free petroleum to locals and it would turn over all the the assets uh, to it to the Iranian government upon expiration and all disputes had to be resolved by a three-person arbitration panel in Tehran. So let us uh, quickly evaluate uh, the Darcy concession within the framework that we discussed before. So how does the risk reward um, trade-off look like? Uh, Iran didn't want to take any um, any risk given its uh, experience with concessions. It didn't pay up any upfront uh, cash or any upfront money. Uh, and it put in an early cancellation clause in case things didn't work out so that it could offer it to the next uh, concession hunter. Uh, by contrast, uh, Darcy took a considerable risk. He paid upfront cash. He took all of the uh, marketing, financial operation, everything, all, all of the risks on. So naturally his uh, return had to be uh, higher than Iran's. So what were the factors impacting Iran's bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis Darcy? Very little, in fact. Uh, Iran had uh, no direct access to bulk buyers. It had uh, no direct access to end users, and the end users were indifferent whether the oil came from Iran or elsewhere. Uh, it, uh, there were many uh, 
opportunities of substitutes being developed around the world. The Royal Dutch Shell was developing oil in Sumatra, in, in the Americas, as well as in South America, oil was coming on, uh, you know, the oil was being developed. And Iran was in dire need for cash. It had multiple failed opportunities. It had an increasingly bad reputation as a host country. And uh, the opportunity for other countries to set to step in and develop their oil uh, um, oil industries was quite high. In this slide, I would like to speak a, a little bit about the sequence of uh, events that led to the establishment of the Iranian oil industry, because there has been a lot of misunderstandings about the sequence of events. Most uh, books or most uh, articles talk about the Darcy concession having been first and then the Admiralty and the Burma company and so on and so forth, uh, coming in at, at a later stage and taking advantage of the uh, privileges that was given to Darcy. Uh, what I would like to argue here is that actually it was the other way around, that it was the Admiralty's uh, desire to switch from coal to oil that gave uh, um, wings to Darcy. So let me go through this uh, sequence. In 1886, uh, um, Burma Oil Company is established in Scotland, and it, uh, it, is, uh, it essentially serves uh, India and, uh, uh, and Burma and, and that uh, you know, region uh, in, of British Empire. Um, in 1890s, um, the Admiralty considers to switch to oil. The Russian and the Italian oil, um, ad, um, navies were already um, using oil, and so this is what led the Admiralty to also say, well, we should perhaps also switch to, to oil. Now, in, uh, in 1901, Darcy gets its, his uh, concession. In uh, 1903, Darcy establishes the first exploration company. So he is in business now, in the sense that the, uh, the condition under the Darcy concession was that if nothing happens within two years, then the, ex uh, then the uh, concession expires. But so Darcy establishes the exploration company. In the same year, in 1903, the Admiralty requests a whole set of uh, oil companies to submit samples for, uh, for uh, their use uh, in uh, in these submarines or in ships, uh, what sort of uh, fuel they could submit. And in 1904, Burma wins the sample, win is the, is, the, uh, is the winner, provided it can demonstrate that it has a supply that could provide a huge uh, volume of uh, oil to the Admiralty, because the Admiralty didn't want to go through so many different uh, suppliers, so they needed, Burma needed to show that it had access to a large supply. Uh, in, the in the same period, Darcy is running out of funds. He has uh, spent essentially all of his money on exploration and is looking for funding. He's looking for funding from the um, from the Rothschilds in France, they turn him down. He turns to the British, uh, to the UK government, they turn him down. And so somehow, uh, Kitabji, uh, our friend Kitabji, who, who was a very uh, important person in bringing uh, Darcy to, or at least the Darcy uh, lawyers to Iran, uh, approaches Burma and says, well, you're looking for, for resources, you're looking for a good uh, deposit, here is um, the Darcy concession. So Burma joins forces uh, with Darcy in uh, developing, or at least in exploring uh, the Iranian oil um, opportunities and they form a concession consortium and Burma becomes a part in this consortium and provides funding. In 1908, finally oil is found and in uh, 1909, the Anglo-Persian oil company is established essentially with two million pounds of uh, funding from the o Burma oil company. In 1913, oil is produced, and in 1914, the contract between Burma and, uh, and the UK government is signed, and the UK government, in order to make sure that the supply is uh, steady and they can, uh, in, and they can um, uh, have access to it, invests or doubles um, the capital of the Anglo-Persian oil company in order to make sure that it expands sufficiently to provide the resources.
So very quickly, the first exploration company is founded with a capital of about 600,000 uh, uh, pounds, of which 20,000 is the rounds paid in, paid in share, according to the Darcy concession, about 3%. Then in 19 of, um, 1905, uh, the concession um, consortium is uh, is expanded with infusion of funds. Again, you know, of course, Iran's share shrinks a little bit. Um, in 1909 is the establishment of APEC with uh, 20, uh, 2 million uh, pounds of, uh, of capital, largely supplied by Burma and, of course, other uh, retail investors. And in 1914, um, British uh, government doubles the uh, doubles uh, Apex capital. Exploration is essentially taking place in this area of Iran. Uh, the rest is not touched. This is a different view of the of the concession area, or at least of the exploration area, with a, a bit of a better understanding of the lay of the land. Uh, this area happens to be also home to many tribes uh, who have to be on good terms or the company has to be on good terms with them. It has to buy um, uh, their land for laying their pipelines or their buildings, as well as uh, it depends on manpower as well as uh, goodwill from these tribes. Here are a few pictures of the um, exploration team as well as you know uh, the oil uh, wells and so and the pipelines that were being laid so very briefly uh, two uh, parallel um, developments that impacted the relationship between Iran and the, uh, and the concessionaire, the company, as well as Iran and the UK uh, very much. The first was the 1906 constitutional revolution, whereby the decisions or major decisions were no longer only taken by the, by the king, but also had to be subject to parliamentary approval. Uh, the second one was the 1907 Anglo-Russian Entente, uh, whereby uh, Russia and, and uh, UK tried to agree or at least uh, uh, agree on certain spheres of influence in all over Russia, not just on Iran. According to this Entente, Iran was divided into, uh, into two spheres, the Russian uh, sphere of influence and the British uh, sphere of influence. As you can notice, the British sphere of influence does not include the oil uh, region and is more uh, geared toward protecting British India. And the clip that you are about to watch is a 1951 propaganda piece by the company. Uh, however, it does provide an insight into and an appreciation for the logistical, technological, topographical challenges in developing the oil fields and bringing the oil uh, to where it could be exported. And the company had to build all of the infrastructure and the installations and Abaddon, which was a marshland island, became a modern city in the process. I raise this point um, because there are many, uh, there may be questions as to whether Iran could have launched its oil uh, industry on its own. Uh, the oil business was the most complex industry of the 20th century in terms of technology, finance, and management. Few countries and few companies within those countries could do it. And most countries could not. And Iran was among the latter group. And uh, at that junction, and even much more, much later. Abaddon, the world's largest oil refinery, which British enterprise and money built, may pass out of British control if Persia carries out the vote for nationalization passed by their parliament. In the barren, arid mountains of Khuzestan, in land where no crop would grow, in land that was just so much waste to Persia, British prospectors looked for oil. And only after seven years did they find it in commercial quantities. There were no roads in the wild places where oil was found. They had to be built to carry the heavy equipment to bring the oil to the surface. Huge derricks had to be built to strike the riches of the earth. Huge power plants were needed so that when the derrick was built, there would be power enough to send the cutting bit maybe two miles down. A 150 miles to the coast, the oil must be moved. 
great pipelines were laid through the mountains, and Abadan, an unknown desert spot, became one of the great oil ports of the world. To thousands of Persians, British enterprise brought well-paid work in good conditions. A vast modern town grew to make life pleasant. Schools for the children, classes to train Persians to do better jobs, hospitals, sanitation, food production units, all these the company provided from the oil shipped abroad. Successive governments in Persia have cooperated with the British. Let us hope that the Persians will not allow themselves to be intimidated by fanatics into a rash act which will lead to disaster for both countries. But very soon, right after production started, uh, and actually throughout the first six years of, uh, of operation, Iran didn't see any, a single penny of uh, royalties being paid to it. And the complications were due to the fact that uh, it was difficult to measure what, what was net profits uh, and 14% of the profits of which company, because as you notice, you know, uh, Burma Oil Company came in and essentially took over the concessioners' um, rights. Uh, and what about the amortization and the depreciation of all the exploration costs that were uh, uh, taking place? What about the losses? What, how do we treat losses of some company versus the other? And uh, again, you know, the key um, definition or the key problems was how to define a subsidiary because under the Darcy concession, um, Iran was uh, eligible for 14% of the uh, of the profits of all companies formed under the concession. So what is what? How to how to value Burma's uh, operations? What what to do with the tanker income that uh, uh, that the company got from oil that was uh, uh, that it uh, carried for uh, from other regions and so on. So soon it became important to uh, fix uh, and clarify the problems uh, that were inherent in the uh, Darcy concession that could not have been anticipated before. First and foremost, there were legal and accounting uh, differences of view. Um, they were clarified. The definition of subsidiary was tightened. Uh, it, then it, it included uh, all subsidiaries throughout the supply chain that dealt with Iranian oil. Um, and as a result, you know, the, the profits were recalculated and re-posted um, on, on that uh, on that basis. Um, there was a damage to the pipeline during World War One that the company wanted to claim from Iran, and that was dropped. That that uh, damage was dropped, and the arrears were recalculated and paid to the Iranian government. Um, it seemed that uh, things were. Uh, being resolved, but um, while APOC approved the Armitage Smith Agreement and paid on that uh, on that front, the Iranian uh, Parliament never um, ratified the Armitage Smith Agreement. So, meanwhile, uh, important events took place in Iran as well. Uh, there was a coup d'état of 1921, which brought to power um, Reza Khan, uh, who later became Reza Shah Pahlavi. Um, and in 1925, uh, Reza, uh, Reza Shah, the Pahlavi, uh, the Qajar dynasty is abolished and the, Pahlavi's, um, uh, the Pahlavi dynasty is established. Uh, Reza Shah's main drives were essentially to, to reassess uh, or re-establish central power uh, uh, across Iran. Uh, he launched a very ambitious uh, uh, reform and modernization program, uh, which also included uh, heavy state in, uh, involvement in industrialization and investment, state investments. So this uh, modernization um, program uh, required uh, substantial resources and it was time to resolve the remaining uh, or at least the, the lingering uh, APOC issues. Um, Reza Shah signs two of his most important uh, ministers to do the negotiations or to restart the negotiations with APEC, Tafi Zadeh and Taimur Tash, and they are involved with, uh, with uh, APEC or for, with uh, Anglo-Persian uh, between 1927 and 1932 for a very, very extended period of time and uh, involved negotiations. Uh, during this period, in 1928, uh, APEC agrees to give Iran a 25% share in the company. Iran hesitates. And as a result, uh, 
when depression hit and the markets changed, APOC took away that, uh, that offer off the table and uh, it was a missed opportunity. Um, Reza Shah becomes very angry with, with this process. There were other factors involved as well. And he cancels the Darcy concession in 1932. Uh, contrary to the wishes of the company, uh, the UK government takes this uh, um, this disagreement or this cancellation of the uh, of the concession to the League of Nations and uh, to the Permanent Court of Justice uh, or International Justice. Um, you know, a scenario that repeats itself in 1951 again, of course. Um, Reza Shah assigns two of his very um, knowledgeable legal minds to. Um, essentially contest uh, uh, UK's action, uh, Dalvar and uh, Alago, uh, and, uh, and present Iran's case, that the court has no jurisdiction uh, to, um, to say anything about this uh, cancellation. And Britain says that, uh, Britain's view is that because of the fact that uh, um, this became, you know, the Shah has abrogated on this, the Iranian courts have no um, uh, ability to, to deal with this uh, with this disagreement. The court decides uh, to um, assign uh, Edvard Banes, who was the president of uh, Czechoslovakia, or who became president of Czechoslovakia later on as a mediator, and required or requested that the status quo be observed. And in fact, oil continued to flow, and, uh, and Apple continued to operate as, as before. So while these uh, negotiations are going on, Sir John Cadman, who was the chairman of, uh, of uh, APOC at that point in time, um, is, uh, believes that he needs to, to deal with this issue on, on his own, and he comes to Iran. He was a, a, a man, he was a diplomat uh, you know, by nature, and was very much um, of the belief that the oil um, industry has to work for Iran as well in order for APEC to be successful. And so he and uh, he decides to confront Reza Shah directly, and the two of them sit together and come up with the 1933 agreement. So what did the 1933 agreement entail? Here are some of the main points. It reduced the uh, concession area uh, by 80%. It, it uh, canceled the pipeline monopoly. It introduced the per ton royalty for oil uh, sold inside Iran as well as oil exported. It had a price escalation clause tied to the price of gold. It had a 20% request, or at least it included a 20% dividend payment paid to ordinary shareholders. It had a minimum uh, early, um, minimum yearly payment of about 671,000 uh, pounds. This was necessary so that Iran could uh, plan for, uh, you know, it, it needed some certainty for planning purposes. It uh, recalculated benefits all the way back or retroactively to 1931 and 32, and Iran get a, got a very in, uh, nice uh, cash payment. It requested a, um, building a new refinery in Kermanshah for domestic usage. Uh, it uh, had um, Iran had access or had claims to 20% of of APOC or AIOC's accumulated post 1932 reserves at the time of expiration. It had. Um, it mandated that Iranian uh, experts be trained as managers and technicians. Iran had the right to check AIOC books and attend ag annual um, stockholders uh, meetings. It uh, set health and sanitation standards within AIOC's buildings. Iran had the right to levy new taxes after a 30-year expiration or at least a, a extension of the uh, of the. Uh, of the concession. Now, what really, um, uh, and APOC received the following, it, it got a 60-year extension of the concession. And this is where uh, the criticism of, the, of this concession, uh, or at least this agreement came in. Why did Iran give a 60-year concession? Um, it had, uh, of course, it had, uh, APOC had the right to uh, select the 100,000 square miles that it was now allowed to have, and it had three years to, to select those, uh, those regions. It had a 30-year tax exemption. 
and it received the safety and security promises or uh, assurances of uh, the Iranian government. So here are some of the very briefly some of the uh, important changes between Darcy and uh, and the 1933 agreement. One of the important things to mention is that um, um, under no uh, none of the, these uh, concessions were uh, was the company obliged to provide housing for workers, and that will become of course an important or sore point later on during the nationalization period. So how do we fare in terms of our framework uh, of uh, for consideration in terms of risk reward as well as the bargain? In considering this uh, this framework, it's important to see where Iran was in 1932 in terms of global production and what percentage of the UK market, which was its main market, Iran occupied. As you can see from these two figures, in 1932, Iran had a very, very slim or sl uh, sliver of the oil market. Um, and as you can see, the sharp decline after 1930 or 20, 1929, 1930, due to the depression. So the, uh, the um, global oil market was not in the best uh, you know, shape uh, as such. And in terms of the uh, demand or the UK market demand, Iran did have a share, a fair share of the uh, of the UK market, but it was not a dominant share. So if Iran had fallen off the market or had stopped producing, very easily other, other producers could have stepped in, particularly from the UK. It's also important to take a look at uh, world prices. As you can see from this, uh, this uh, figure here, uh, there was a sharp decline in oil prices due to oil glut uh, from 1927 onwards. And in 1932, which is the, uh, which, which, uh, which you see here, there was probably the lowest uh, point in terms of oil prices, global oil prices. Iran's bargaining position improved a little bit vis-a-vis uh, -vis APEC because the bad uh, global market uh, avoided or at least prevented new entrants to enter the, the market. Uh, there was depression, so Iran didn't have to worry about being displaced in the low, uh, global market by new entrants. Uh, it still had the, the problem with you know, threat of substitutes because oil could come from the Americas, which had suffered the most in terms of the, uh, the downturn. Uh, it improved a little bit in terms of its access to end users because the Admiralty had already switched its uh, use uh, from coal to Iranian oil. So it was not that easy for the Admiral to, to switch back to somebody, some other source of oil. It continued to have uh, no access to direct buyers or direct other direct bulk buyers. So in terms of risk reward uh, trade off, Iran uh, took on a little bit more risk in the sense that it uh, tied its, uh, its uh, um, instead of 14% of, um, of profits, it tied its uh, repayments from or at least its payments from the AIOC to 20% uh, of dividends um, uh, distributed. Um, but other than that, Iran gained quite a bit, so it moved up, it moved up a little bit from the position that it had before under, under the Darcy concession, a little bit more uh, toward reward. But uh, APEC, by contrast, continued to have uh, uh, the lion's share of risk, and of course, it also had the lion's share of rewards. Just briefly, how the Iranian um, payment profile looked. It was, uh, uh, you know, flat uh, under circumstances when the market was really bad. Uh, it went up uh, depending on how much oil was being imported, and it, of course, it could have a high uh, upward potential in terms of the dividends or the the, the way that the company did overall and the 20% of the dividends that were being paid out. So what was the impact of the 1933 agreement in general? Having been given the security of a 60-year concession in 1933, the company decided to invest heavily in Iran. And as you can see from the level of capital expenditures that took place from uh, 19, um, uh, 1930 to 1950. And uh, with that capital expenditure, of course, came also the uh, level of uh, 
employees and contractors that were hired within Iran on uh, on oil uh, in the oil. Here is the uh, pattern of Iranian oil, oil production starting from 1910 to 1950. And as you can see, after the 1930s, uh, it, uh, oil production increased considerably. Uh, it is still important to understand where and how much of the global oil market Iran provided, because uh, as you can see, uh, despite the fact that the oil production grew considerably, Iran was still only providing probably around you know, four to five percent of global oil market. I raise this because the impression that we get from reading many of these books uh, in uh, or articles is that Iran was a huge uh, supplier of oil, as you can see from these uh, from the schema, is that it was still a marginal supplier. Uh, most importantly, the investment in the Abadan refinery was significant, and the Abadan refinery uh, increased its output considerably. With this figure, I would like to show you that uh, the Anglo-Persian or Anglo-Iranian oil company had also interests in other oil fields in the Middle East. And as you can see here, while it 100% uh, of Iran's oil production went to Anglo-Iranian, 50% of, of Kuwait's, and uh, about a quarter of Iraq's oil production was also um, uh, you know, went into the Anglo-Iranian. So Iran was in a way receiving also uh, a, a return uh, or at least dividends from uh, Anglo-Iranians uh, uh, revenue from these other oil. And given the output of Abadan and given the capital expenditures that the uh, company invested in, uh, in Abadan, Abadan became the world's largest refinery and certainly AIOC's most important refinery around the world. Uh, I want to raise this point because if it hadn't been for the 1933 uh, agreement, which gave AIOC a 60 year um, essentially uh, concession security and cash flow security, uh, AIOC could have very easily invested those resources in Basra and developed a, you know, its biggest uh, oil refinery in Basra instead of Abadan. And uh, that would have been to the detriment. Now, I talked about the fact that with the heavy capital expenditure came also a heavy uh, employment uh, of uh, the Iranian workforce between 1930 and 1951. I will dwell on this a little bit. So here is a distribution of the uh, workers or the workforce across the uh, different categories, uh, both foreign as well as Iranian. About 94% of the workforce in, in the Iranian industry was Iranian. That is much higher than, uh, than the workforce or the local workforce in other regions or in other uh, oil developing countries in the region. Uh, it is also important to note that even among the staff or senior staff, uh, Iranians were present. Iranians were, um, you know, had high positions in these uh, fields, in, in these uh, grades as well. Here is a much more uh, detailed um, distribution or at least evolution of Iranian uh, versus uh, British versus Indian work, uh, workers uh, inclusion in, in the oil industry. One of the points that I would like to raise is that in uh, 1950, Saudi Arabia um, exported around 36 uh, you know, million tons and Iran exported about 31 million tons. Um, I decided to say, I decided to kind of calculate uh, how many locals were employed per thousand tons of, uh, of uh, oil production. And in Saudi Arabia, as you can see, it's 0.27 employees. So in other words, for every 4,000 uh, tons, they employed one employee. Whereas in Iran, for every thousand tons, they employed 2.2 employees. So the Iranian oil industry was much more uh, uh, labor intensive and also local labor intensive, as you can see. 
So here is the uh, progression or the trend line of the different uh, incomes. Uh, between uh, 1932 and 1941, Iran's uh, income from, or at least royalties from the oil uh, uh, industry really surpassed uh, the British uh, returns, Brit returns on, uh, uh, on the British uh, investment or the, to the British uh, treasury. But after 1941, um, it, there is a huge divergence. And that is a result uh, of, um, that is the result of an increased uh, corporate tax rate that impacted all companies in the UK, a state mandate that uh, dividends should be reduced, dividend payouts should be reduced considerably across all the companies, and that there were exchange rate controls. So these three factors impacted Ira the Iranian returns and um, limited Iran's uh, royalty payments in the, or at least not as much in the uh, post-war years. Uh, sort of like around 1948, 49, um, efforts were being made to address this issue. Um, and APEC agreed that Iranian dividends should be calculated and distributed before taxes, pre-tax, and pre-other uh, UK-specific rules that affected other UK companies. Uh, Iran was offered a 65 million um, adjustment, exposed adjustments uh, for you know going back uh, to whatever. Um, you know, wherever the differences uh, um, occurred, and there was an increase in the uh, at the wellhead price of uh, royalties. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, it, the negotiations didn't lead anywhere because by then Iran wanted to have a 50-50. Um, arrangement as had been uh, promulgated by the Aramco deal, although the structure of AIOC and Aramco were quite different. To conclude, um, the oil business was the 20th century's most financially and technologically complex industry. It had high risks, it was vertically integrated, it had an oligopolistic structure, it had high entry barriers. Iran could certainly not have built its oil industry on its own. It had failed to attract investors before and it didn't attract many investors afterwards. However, behind the allegations of bad faith that occurred from time to time and accusations of, you know, of, uh, um, of cheating or of being disingenuous was really a genuine misunderstanding uh, between the two different uh, perspectives uh, and uh, divergent goals. Uh, APEC wanted to become a global oil major and Iran needed vast oil needs. Uh, and these uh, two objectives kind of clashed from time to time. Of course, the OPEC corporate governance and the OPEC uh, accounting of APEC, which was essentially a little bit driven by the structure of the oil industry because APEC wanted to, to preserve its, uh, its um, uh, secrets from other uh, oil companies as well, uh, were at times um, uh, at fault in uh, to under, for Iran to understand uh, uh, what was going on, and that kind of fed into the uh, an environment of mistrust. However, having said that, given Iran's circumstances and given the global circumstances and the global market conditions, the 1933 agreement was a win-win situation for both sides. Um, because it mitigated to a large extent the downside risks of both sides and incorporated a reasonable upside potential for, again for both sides. And uh, there were of course differences that needed to be ironed out and the agreement left a door open for those differences to be, um, to be resolved. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to your questions and uh, uh, comments. Thank you. That was great. So we have a few questions coming in that I'm going to pass along. Um, one viewer says, do you think the foreign powers like Britain taking over Iranian oil industrialization under the monarchy was actually beneficial in the development of the technology needed to extract oil? Or do you think without the British and or other powers, the Iranians could still have developed all the technology needed and maximize their profits from the oil? Uh, well, my view is that, uh, no, it was, this was a very, very um, technology, as I mentioned in the, my last slide, it's, it was, it, it was the, 
the most complex industry of the 20th century. And Iran was did not have the, um, the manpower, did not have the finances, did not have the technology, did not have any of the ingredients that were important for the development of such an uh, such a complex industry. Uh, it needed to have access to markets. Again, Iran was not uh, didn't have access to those, such markets. Um, and so on. Now, I have to, uh, to I want to make one point about uh, this, uh, the, the contract to the Admiralty, because it has been raised many times of, look, you know, the, the Admiralty was taking advantage of, uh, of, of Iranian oil. Uh, yes, of course, they were buyer and they were, they were buying it at a discount. But I think that the buying of discount, uh, we should put it into, into a bit of a context. I mean, if you're a producer, let's say you produce uh, fruit juice, uh, apple juice, and suddenly Costco comes in and says, look, I'm going to buy your uh, fruit juice for a very large uh, quantity. And for the next 40, 50 years, naturally, the, that uh, any seller would, would give a, a discount to, to such an such a important bulk buyer. Uh, and I think that issue has been a bit misunderstood in the in the sense that Iranians have always thought that well, you know, um, the admiralty should have bought the 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 oil at retail prices, even though there were you no know, retail prices as such available. Uh, so the any bulk in any industry in any um, in any I would say sector in any operation a long time huge bulk buyer will always get a get a um, get a discount and now the second point about the admiralty was that because of the fact that it was one big um, big uh, order of one type of fuel it allowed uh, the it allowed a large degree of economy of scale for for apple because it didn't have you know uh, if it had wanted to sell that uh, that same amount of uh, oil to other producers it would have had to kind of customize uh, every country had a, or every user had a different specification germany wanted to have this kind of specification france wanted something else but in in terms of a bulk uh, bulk uh, uh, product they could uh, they could specify on one specification and be able to sell it in uh, in in a uh, in a you know in a large quantity and uh, have considerable savings and that savings of course the savings of not having to uh, customize the product went of course also to in, in into uh, what was also beneficial for Iran in that sense now having uh, coming back to the question that was asked um, could Iran have developed this uh, this industry by itself? I don't know. If Iran cannot. Uh, Iran has problems, uh, you know, almost 120 years later, with uh, keeping up with uh, in such in this industry. Again, I'm not an oil expert, but from what I read, I see that Iran has a difficulty still today, after you know 120 years of uh, of being in this business. Of, of this sector being the most important sector in its economy, it still has uh, difficulties of, of having access to technology, to, fi uh, to financing, and so on. So, um, you know, going back that many years, I mean, that, that, that such a long before, no, I don't think that Iran would have been able to, to develop its, uh, its oil industry without uh, external help be it from, uh, from the UK or be it some, from anywhere else. But the, of course, the UK was, uh, had, of course, common interests on this uh, matter with Iran. Thank you. Another viewer asked, could you speak a little bit about the opposition that APOC encountered on the ground, meaning from workers, labor strikes, tribes, et cetera, and what was the relationship of the state to the workers who protested the company? And then just to add on to that, another, another viewer says, what was the Iranian people's sentiment during these negotiations and the whole concessions process? How did it change over time? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I think that the best, uh, uh, the best account of worker conditions, uh, again, I, I want to, to refer to one of the po points that I made, uh, made, is that in none of the, con uh, none of the um, you know, concessions, was there any clause about the fact that the company needs to provide housing for, for, its, uh, 
for its workers. It, it talks about buildings uh, and so on. It talks even about, you know, uh, medications, about anything like, but it doesn't, it doesn't say anything about housing. So the housing that the company provided was over and, and above what was required by it um, or to it from uh, in, in the concessions. I, I, I didn't see any reference to that. And I didn't, I didn't read about any reference to that either. Uh, so the big uh, opposition to the company was mostly about uh, about uh, housing, and the housing issue became a, a quite acute in the 19, let's say 49, uh, 50s because of the huge uh, expansion that I showed you that the company, uh, the huge um, capital expenditures as well as the uh, worker expansion that came uh, that um, took place. It was during the same time as uh, Europe was being uh, rebuilt, the reconstruction in Europe, post-war reconstruction. And there was very, very, uh, it was a big, there was a big shortage of building products across the world, across the, the, the United, I mean, across uh, the UK as well as elsewhere. And so the part of the problem of the housing that people complain about, even though there was you know, housing for very, uh, lack of housing for a fairly small sh share of the, of the workers and certainly of the lower level workers, um, came from the fact that the company couldn't build houses fast enough. Uh, my, the, the reason why I'm saying that is that I am, uh, the evidence that I use for this uh, statement is a report that the ILO, the International Labour Organization, prepared about the Iranian oil uh, industry in 1950, so just the year before the, before the nationalization, so as it, it is as, as current as could be. And in that report, they are actually stating that uh, how the company is, is uh, paying, uh, you know, de determining wages, how the company is determining benefits, even the housing. The housing was, uh, was determined on the basis of seniority. In other words, if you were there for longer, you would get, of course, you know, uh, have access. It's like any other company that would, of course, um, it would be seniority based, both in terms of grade as well as in terms of uh, length of uh, length of service and the people who were really at the um, at the I would say um, didn't get the housing that they expected were the ones that were recent uh, hires to the to the uh, company and uh, for them it was difficult to to um, for the company it was difficult to build up the the housing that it was necessary. So this is one of the areas that that uh, you know there was a lot of complaints or so. Uh, as you could see, you know, in terms of the uh, the uh, rising, the, the company built a, an entire university, a college, and a, a petroleum college, a Donishka Naft, in Abadan. It it built it it uh, provided uh, uh, scholarships for the better students to go to uh, to I think uh, Manchester was or Birmingham one of one of the uh, places where the, the there was a strong uh, petroleum industry uh, curriculum uh, even people like uh, most of the Iranian um, managers at the company had actually gone to this um, to this university both internally as well as externally for instance Mustafa Fateh, Mehdi Bazargan a lot of these people had actually attended that uh, that uh, program. The, uh, the company provided, uh, for instance, uh, hospitals, free hospitals. Uh, it provided, of course, you know, uh, entertainment, movies. Uh, and in terms of the housing, I, I mean, I have I have talked to a, to a lot of people who lived in Abadan and who worked in Abadan during that time. When I talked to Iranians, I said, so where did you live? Well, did you live in really squalid place, uh, uh, um, dwellings or so? I said, no, 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 we lived in, we lived almost in the same places, depending on their rank, of course. Now we have to admit that, you know, the company was hiring as much as it could from internally, from inside Iran in, for all of its positions. Uh, the, the British people who were coming to Iran, the expatriates, were of the higher grades because that's where the company was, you know, that's how the company could leverage uh, human capital internally as well as internally. And naturally, because they were more senior or more, you know, uh, uh, higher grade people, they were getting better houses, but 
for those people, for those, let's say, 39 um, Iranian managers who are at the same level as the British uh, uh, British uh, ma managers, they received the same housing as, as they, they had access to the same uh, club, they had access to the same place. So it was, everything was according, you know, it was a very um, hierarchical uh, society, both in Iran as well as in the UK. And people had, uh, uh, it was very, access was determined on the basis of hierarchy. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, the second question, could you repeat it again? I forgot. <laughs> I, I, uh, sure. I um, what was the Iranian people's sentiment during these negotiations and the whole concessions process? How did it change over time? Yeah, well, uh, part of the, uh, uh, you know, the sentiment was uh, fueled by Iranians themselves, for instance, during the 1933 uh, concession, uh, Ali Dashti, who was both, uh, I think he had a, um, a, a newspaper at that time, as well as I think he was a member of parliament, he was being commissioned by Reza Shah, by Taymur Tash, by all of these other people to write really negative articles about, uh, about uh, the, uh, you know, the British. And he was very much sort of like um, nationalistic and so on. And uh, it was, uh, part of it was uh, self, uh, how should I say, self, um, you know, it was it was generated by Iranians themselves. Okay, why don't you write something about this? And I have to say that the 1933 cancellation, the Zosha had a bone to pick with the British on many other issues. For instance, the Bahrain issue, the uh, Hengam um, Island issue in the Persian Gulf, and so on. And he wanted to kind of show a little bit uh, sh a show of force against the Brits. So that was also. Uh, a factor that played into the very the coup de théâtre type of uh, cancellation of the Darcy um, Darcy uh, concession. But uh, coming back to the sentiments, the only way that we can measure sentiments, because there were of course no polls or no uh, you know other things, is through the the media and. There, when I look at or when I read about it, I see that a uh, large part of it was self, how should I say, self um, uh, promoted by the by the um, um, by the regime itself, by the by the Zosha itself. So the Iranian people, actually, most of them were rural people. They didn't really, you know, know much about it. Um, but coming back to the ILO report, I would re certainly recommend anybody to read this ILO report. And I'm really surprised that in none of the Iranian books is there any mention of, the, uh, of this ILO report, which goes into extreme detail about uh, how uh, wages were determined. For instance, a level X, uh, let's say a, a higher level worker would receive six sacks of, of rice and five sacks of, uh, so, uh, I mean, of, let's say, lentils and, and his, his, uh, his uh, wages were determined. His dwelling was determined of, of how many people he had in the family and so on. It's, it's a very, very, it's a 50 page report and an Iranian uh, expert was involved in the team that went in a three-man team that went to Abadan, and they spent almost a month, a month and a half, going step by step through the through the Abadan, um, you know, uh, of the oil workers. Uh, how much, for instance, were they able to to uh, uh, develop, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, groups uh, in order to advocate for themselves? Uh, I don't really know. I don't remember the, the, the exact term, but certainly I would recommend people who have any uh, questions about that, about uh, these things, to, to look at this ILO report of 1950. Thank you. I want to uh, group two questions together, thinking about Iran in relation to its neighbors. One viewer says, how do you compare the terms of the concession in terms of royalty with those of other countries in the Middle East around that time? And then another viewer writes, I wonder what was the situation in other neighbor countries like Iraq or Saudi Arabia at the, at the ones in the Persian Gulf at the time of the Darcy concession when it was signed? Was the West investing in them as well? Did they have a better reputation for keeping their promises? Did the competition affect Iranian officials' decisions? I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't done as much research in those uh, in those uh, areas. Uh, of course, many of these countries um, that later on became independent countries were part of the Ottoman Empire, um, and there, of course, there was uh, the, the there were there were concessions with 
the Turkish Petroleum Industry uh, Company, which later on became the Iraqi Petroleum Company, did exist uh, before the, in fact, you know, Gulbekian that I mentioned was part of that, uh, um, that concession. Um, you know, I think the Iranian concession depended very much on the previous concessions. For instance, the 40,000 was kind of uh, um, taken from the concession that uh, was given or uh, um, was given to Reuters. So in, in the case of Darcy, then they decided to split it because, uh, you know, the 40, 20,000 up front and 20,000 later. The 16% was again, you know, the, uh, developed uh, earlier. There were many, many concessions. So there was a kind of a, a consistency uh, among these concessions that Iran gave. And of course, when you read again, you know, people, uh, books like uh, uh, Daniel Jurgens and everything, the Darcy concession was not out of line at all with uh, concessions that were given to other countries. So the whole, um, how should I say, ecosystem of concessions were somewhat regulated. For instance, the Shell concession in Sumatra was not vastly out of line with, uh, with uh, either worse or better than, for instance, the uh, the ones, the Darcy concession. But of course, that needs to be, it's a different uh, research project by itself. Now, coming back to the question of how did they, how did the other countries, the, certainly the Persian Gulf uh, sheikdoms or Emirates or, you know, countries, Saudi Arabia, during the time or at the time of Darcy, they, there was no, there was no, uh, you know, commercially viable operation or commercially viable um, uh, you know, concession. I think they started to have concessions around the 1930s or mid 30s or so, I forget. Um, but it's also important to note one thing. People like to comp compare the 50-50 in terms of uh, Aramco and, and Iran. AIOC was, had, needs to be compared with the Exxons of the world. It was a global company. Aramco, can be compared to you know, the national Iranian oil company, which was established afterwards. It was only purely, only focused on Saudi, I mean, Aramco was only on Saudi Arabia. So when it sold its oil 50-50, it was oil at, you know, at, the, at the FOB price 50-50. Uh, Iran was involved in the bigger operation. And I just took a look at the um, at the reserved uh, accumulated reserves of uh, of British petroleum in 1993 when the when you know the concession was supposed to have uh, expired the 1933 uh, concession was supposed to have expired the accumulated reserves of BP in 1933 of which Iran was entitled to 20 percent of it was considerable was a very very large um, you know, amount, and that did not kind of figure in or or capture. That wasn't captured in the in the percentage. I, I know that I was reading somewhere that Iran went from I don't know 17 cents on the barrel to 23 cents on the barrel between the Darcy and the 1933 um, uh, you know 33 agreement. But when you capture in the long-term return that Iran would have gotten, or the or the twenty percent, or you know all of these other factors, it's difficult to compare. It's difficult to compare the Darcy uh, return to the 1933 return, and it's also difficult to to compare. This is why it hasn't been really done, or it, if it has been done, it has been done very kind of uh, back of the envelope type of uh, approach. Um, it's also very difficult to compare, let's say, the 1933 with Aramco, because Aramco was just, let's say, it's as if you, ha you have a shoe store and you're selling your shoes, uh, you know, to, a, to, a, uh, to, a, to buyers, or you are part of, let's say, um, you have uh, an interest in um, Neiman Marcus. And you're selling your shoes through Neiman Marcus, and not only are you getting a pair of, you know, a, a, a price per shoe, but then also you have a share of the income of Neiman Marcus. So it's very difficult to compare. And 
I have looked a lot for this comparison, but I haven't found it. And if anybody has it, please do uh, send send it to me. I would be very interested to to take a look at that. Thank you. We have more uh, questions and comments. I want to thank everyone who's staying on later. We'll try to get to as many as we can. If you can't stay with us, um, we'll have them in the recording later. Um, Ms. Chong, I want to pass along um, some appreciative comments from viewers who thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, a few more questions. One viewer says, um, why couldn't Iran leverage the Anglo-Iranian oil company to build other infrastructure in the country um, rather when the treaty was just focused on oil? Um, and then someone else writes, the revenue Iran received from the Darcy concession was used for royal trips, et cetera, not to develop the country. Perhaps it would have been better if the concession was not given at that time. What do you think? Iran, Iran did, I mean, when you look at the, um, you know, there, there were, um, how should I say, backward linkages into the country. Um, I mean, the whole area, the whole region of Khuzestan uh, was, you know, developed very quickly over uh, over the period uh, of, of the concession. Um, I mean, I like always to, to use the, the word that, you know, for uh, this, this example that when I was born in Tehran, and I won't tell you which year, but when I was born in Tehran, Tehran didn't have uh, running water. It, it had, uh, it had uh, little um, sort of like uh, uh, wells, and uh, every now and then or every day a, a truck would come by and sell uh, uh, sell uh, drinking water but abadan had sewage and it had potable water it had you know everything so abadan had uh, i mean the whole area had actually benefited quite a bit from uh, from the um, and, and frankly when when uh, reza shah goes to uh, to um, to Khuzestan and he went twice. He went, he traveled to Khuzestan twice when there was no, uh, no uh, railroad and so on, just to observe what he could get from the, the company, what he could get. And he was uh, very, he realized that the level of development that Khuzestan had received from the company, I mean, it was only 20 years uh, old, the concession by then, was considerably more than what he could get from anywhere else. So this is why, he played hard to get and he you know he pushed and he did this but i think in the end uh, given the circumstances of 1933 let us not forget 1933 was the depth of the depression and the whole world was coming uh, apart perhaps we have a better appreciation of what was going on during the depression now with the covid situation or for instance with the uh, you know with what happened in 2008 uh, you know maybe now we have a better understanding that the world could fall apart uh, during that time i think that having gotten the the commitments that he got under the 1933 um, agreement is not insignificant and i would not um, how should I say, um, lighten it by saying that, you know, it couldn't, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, any achievement. Uh, um, there were many, many, uh, I mean, uh, artisans and uh, jobs and uh, uh, that were created, in, I mean, 75,000 people worked for the industry, but then there were contractors that were delivering to the industry workers. So the impact of the oil industry was significant. 75,000 people at that time uh, was about a quarter of Iran's industrial workforce. I'm not counting the farmers and the, you know, and the government officials, but the people who were working in the industrial or the uh, at that more advanced sector. So it was a quarter of that. Creating jobs for 75,000 people in a, uh, you know, at, it, at that time was not insignificant. So it is, uh, it is quite a, um, it, it was quite a big industry for Iran. You know, again, the world's largest, the world's largest refinery was in Abadan. It was not in uh, Texas or in California or in New Jersey, it was in Abadan. So that is something that we need to, uh, to take into account uh, for that. Um. Thank you. Um, there have been a few questions about who was involved in the accounting side of this, who managed um, for the purpose of com computing the costs. Can you provide more information on how the accounting happened? And was Iran privy to the actual and real figures? <laughs> 
So uh, I think that the, here is a. I thank you for. I thank whoever posed this question for this uh, for this um, uh, for this question. Uh, first of all, uh, APEC was a publicly traded company, uh, and there were individual uh, investors involved as well as the government. And when you read through the documents, the the British investors as well as the government as well as the taxpayers provided the biggest check on 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 uh, on on the Anglo-Iranian itself. I mean, you read through uh, documents and documents, and even you know. Uh, um, newspapers and so on that they they hold uh, the feet of APOC to the fire of about its accounting about its profits about its so whatever impacted those other shareholders both the retail shareholders individual shareholders as well as the government the taxpayer was also benefiting Iran and there is a lot of um, due diligence that was being done by these companies by these um, you know um, stockholders or shareholders. In addition to that, Iran had a commissioner. Iran had a commissioner by the name of Mr. Uh, Isa Khan Faiz, who was a commissioner during, um, during the whole period of, um, of Darcy until 1932. And he was receiving, the Iranian government would appoint him. He lived in London. The Iranian government would appoint him, but the, the company paid him. And his salary was a thousand pounds per year. In 1932, that salary was increased to 2,000 pounds per year, and Iran had the right to check the books and to attend the, the stockholders meeting, just the same way as, as every other you know, uh, stockholder. And uh, to, to a large extent, Iran did exercise that, uh, that, uh, that right. Uh, I don't know who who came after uh, Isa Khan Faiz. I don't know. Uh, I don't have. I I haven't seen the name, but Iran did have someone who was there and who could have the same access to the to the um, books as every other shareholder or as, even as the as the British government. Of course, the British government had two board members, but these board members only had the right to veto. Um, company decisions in case it was a national security. But on commercial, uh, commercial uh, let's say, decisions, they had no right to, 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 to have an input. And Iran had been given the same kind of right with that 25% uh, share um, you know, uh, offer, but Iran wanted to have voting, full voting rights, which the company didn't want to, have, to give. Um, so Iran had that capability. Um, in terms of accounting, uh, they were, it, it was submitted to you know, the chartered accountants. Of course, there were differences of opinion. And during the, uh, the Smith, Smith Armitage um, conversations, two different accountants were hired, one by Iran and one by the other, uh, by the APOC side. And they did disagree on accounting principles. Which is very simple. I mean, it happens, um, you know, very often, and uh, even today, anywhere else, with any other country. And uh, they did, but they said that it depends on the interpret and the legal inter interpretation of the uh, the the um, you know the the concession. And so, therefore, they brought in two legal experts to to interpret this. And this is where the legal experts said that, look, if we are going to count the profits of all the companies that are involved in in, in the AIOC, including Burma and you know the the, the um, tanker service and so on and so forth, are we allowed to put in also? to, to uh, take into account the losses of these companies, because you cannot only have the profits, but not the losses. And Iran at that point in time said, no, no, I don't want to have the losses involved. So in other words, they went back to, a, to, the, uh, to the formula that they would only take into account the, the profit of subsidiaries that were involved in the Iranian oil business, inside and outside. So. Uh, so that was the, the discussion. So there were a lot of uh, accounting, uh, you know, accounting um, changes of, uh, you know, differences of opinion. And when the when Iran made the, the points, the case, as was the case in the, you know, with uh, Armitage Smith or later on during the, um, the supplementary uh, agreement, you know, when Iran made the point and the case was made, the, the, the company was obliged to, to 
adjust its payments to Iran, and they did, or the British government was obliged to adjust its payments as they did with the dividend calculation, post or pre-tax dividend calculations. Um, that's 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 what what uh, did happen. Thank you. Just a few more questions. Um, a viewer writes, it is very interesting to see the trade off between resources needed for developing the oil industry and state control of the industry. Can we say Iran's approach to oil has not changed? Uh, I haven't really um, done any any um, research or any um, detailed study of the Iranian oil industry post nationalization. I haven't done that. So I cannot be a good source for this um, for this question. And certainly I'm not an oil expert. I mean, I'm not, not an oil sector expert. I think others would be able to answer this much more authoritatively than myself. Thank you. Uh, another viewer says, what do you think about Paris Azeh's later, later efforts to disengage from the 1933 deal and claiming he was a tool of Reza Shah? Yeah. That's a good point. That's a very, very good point. I would like to say that actually, you know, I, I mentioned that between 1927 and 1932, uh, there were large number of, uh, of um, negotiations back and forth, you know, Cadman would come to Iran, Taymurtash and Tarizadeh would go. To, I actually find that to be, uh, Tarizadeh to be, a, you know, a very disruptive uh, person in this process. First of all, during that period when, uh, when Iran was uh, being offered this deal and why did Iran hesitate? Because there was a rivalry between him and, and Taymurtash. And that the two of them, uh, you know, even though they were really very well informed and very well, I would say, educated, uh, you know, sophisticated people, but there was a there was a, a rivalry between the two of them, and they kind of tried to undermine each other. And I wouldn't, uh, and even though Tarizade in the end, uh, you know, Temurtash, as you know, uh, he was. Uh, uh, imprisoned afterwards and kind of exited before the 1932, um, 1933 agreement was put in place and Tagizade prevailed. Um, but, uh, and he was, you know, because he was the minister of finance, he had to sign the do document. Uh, you know, the thing is that, you know, you buy a house today, 10 years later, it might not be suitable for you, but you cannot say, "Oh, you know what? I didn't sign the the, the treaty. My my wife signed, or my husband said, signed the treaty." At that point in time, there was no better deal in for Iran on, on the table. There was no better deal, and Iran could not have had, had a better deal. So uh, even though Tarizadeh came said, "Oh, you know, it wasn't me. I was forced to to sign this and so on," which I think was it was really a very um, very unfortunate uh, because it kind of, you know, fueled into the nationalistic, nationalist, whatever uh, narrative. Uh, you know, these guys were involved, were heavily involved in the negotiations and he could very easily know that there wasn't any better deal for, for Iran at that point in time. And he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, you know, live up to that. Uh, to that uh, uh, statement. He essentially he pushed the um, the how should I say the responsibility away from himself. Thank you. Another viewer writes, as you know, Iranian nationalists have made arguments against these arguments that you're making, suggesting that the oil company was a colonial entity. How would you respond to this claim? How can we reconcile these two points of view? Well, I don't. It depends very much what we mean with colonial entity. I mean, what 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 was so colonial? About? I mean, yes, if, of course, any investment is like that. Yes, of course, the the, the UK, uh, you know, taxpayers um, paid uh, huge amounts into this company in order to make it possible for Iran to develop its oil business. And naturally, again, you know, if Iran had done the reverse, if Iran had invested, let's say. Uh, was the big and and the and the AIOC was became the UK's biggest corporation. So we are not talking about some minor, small, you know, uh, um, company somewhere. It became its biggest investment, overseas investment. It was the biggest corporation and so on. 
if Iran had invested in that, if if it had been Iran, we would have Iran would have taken an interest in and uh, should have taken and better would have uh, better taken interest in the taxpayers' money that went into this company and to to develop it and to 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 broad. I I mean I I'm not trying to to justify anything the UK did anywhere around the world, but it is natural from the perspective of an investor to be vigilant, to be, you know, to do everything you want uh, to do uh, on, uh, you know, uh, uh, in surviving. And for, for Iran to expect that this would not take place is a bit, uh, I would say it's a bit um, naive to think that, you know, they would put in so much money and not be involved. Yes, of course they would be involved. Uh, the only issue is that manage it, manage this involvement, uh, make sure that you 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 have the your horses or your, your ducks in a row to to manage this uh, this uh, this engagement, and that you are informed when you sit at the table. Make sure that you are you 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 have done your homework instead of you know what the nationalists said, and this is why why I kind of you know I'm surprised. Some of the some of the arguments that they put forward later on, I would you know I can maybe next time I'm invited to to this Stanford when my book comes out. Um, some of the arguments that they made at the time when they made it at the market you know during the market environment that uh, that the nationalization process took place uh, were totally anachronistic. I mean they were just not uh, you know you couldn't take them seriously. So my view is that yes, they were involved, and they made it possible for Iran. I mean, let's let's face it, there were no other dancers in in the process. Iran Iran had already filled up its dance card with all of these failed concessions. And nobody was knocking on its door and everything. And they came and they provided Iran with the most important uh, industry that we had. And again, I'm not. Justifying, I'm not. I have nothing to do with with the UK. Uh, I am. I don't even have anything to do with the United States. I'm not a U.S. citizen, and I'm not a UK UK citizen. But having said that, it's just uh, the point is that uh, yeah, we you know you invite foreign investors to to develop your your uh, your industry to provide employment and income and you know and 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 all of these for your. You have to manage it and. Uh, um, some in certain periods, Iran managed it very well. Iran got away with many things that it wanted. It, it should, uh, and I, I, here I would like to uh, maybe to challenge the perspective of some of these people who present Iran as being, you know, a victim, as having been at the receiving end of uh, of many of these. Uh, 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 no, Iran actually, when I look through this period, Iran acted very very strongly i think we should be very proud of ourselves that we got the uk to to agree to pay to uh, to pay 65 million dollars in retro re retro whatever in um, back pay it, we should be very proud of the fact that we made the the um, apoc come to the table and not only sign an agreement for 1933 but then retroactively uh, apply the the same benefit to 1931 and give us a, a, I mean, I think that it, it is wrong for us to think that we were always a, a victim. We were not always the victim. We actually acted very, very strongly in very many uh, times. There were times when we kind of let things go and uh, we paid the price for it. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I think that very many, on very many occasions, Iran, um, the Iranian Policymakers, contrary to what is being projected of them, they acted actually uh, quite responsibly, pragmatically, and they did uh, they did what they could get away with. Thank you so much. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Um, if we have uh, Dr. Mani, if you have any final thoughts before we sign off, uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful informative talk. I learned a great deal from it. Uh, and uh, I, I know that uh, there are people who uh, have a very different view on this very contested issue. I think uh, the oil issue uh, from the 1933 to the nationalization is one of the uh, most contested, uh, most uh, conflicted uh, uh, issues uh, in our modern history. And uh, your presentation from which I learned a great deal 
is certainly one very detailed scholarly point of view. There are other ways of looking at this and we very much have in the past uh, uh, had posts who had offered a different view and in the future we will hear from you about the 1951, 53, as well as others. Uh, thank you very much for this very informative and uh, I'm sure controversial presentation. Thank you so much, yes. Thank you very much for inviting me. And again, if I had repeated everything that everyone else is uh, saying, then what would be the value of my presentation? Absolutely. But I wanted to present this other perspective. Thank you. Absolutely, it's a wonderful perspective. Thank you very much for your great work. Thanks. Thank you very much.